Folks, welcome to today's brown bag. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, as usual, I have a few announcements about upcoming events. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, we've got uh, um, actually tomorrow uh, is a lecture uh, by uh, Roman Sukach, uh, who was in here uh, last week and did a really, really interesting uh, lecture on everyday life in Czechoslovakia. Uh, but he's going to be speaking on the Sudeti, uh, Sudeti land experience, uh, the Palimpsest. That says memory of Salacia. Uh, and that's going to be from 4 to 5 in the Alderson Auditorium over in the Kansas Union. Uh, and then when? In the Kansas Union or the Alderson Auditorium. One time. Uh, from 4 to 5. 4 to 5. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then uh, tomorrow evening, we have the first in a series of uh, films that are going to be showing as part of the environmental and uh, international environmental film fest. And so we're showing the Battle of Chernobyl, uh, it's a fairly recent documentary exactly what you would, you would think, but it's also going to feature a talk by Tatiana uh, Kutsko, who's been featured uh, in several different uh, news stories, the Kansas City Star and on the local stations in Kansas City. She's uh, originally from Belarus, uh, but is somebody who's getting ready to compete in the Paralympics in Rio in 2016, I think, so she's going to be speaking there. Uh, and then Friday night, uh, we have a, uh, a slogan, um, Friday night at Kino. Uh, and that uh, is going to be good night, Missy. I won't, I won't uh, massively the pronunciation on that. But those are always 7 p.m. Uh, here in 318 Bailey. Uh, we have popcorn, we have uh, uh, sodas, and, and so on and so forth. So we welcome you to uh, come to that. Next week, I just want to mention that we're uh, going to be doing something that we do every fall where we invite uh, students who have done study abroad over the summer or the preceding year. Uh, come in and talk to us about their study abroad experiences. And I'm, I've contacted several people. I'll be in contact with you again. Uh, but if you are one of those people and I haven't been in touch with you, please drop me a note because uh, I'd like to talk to you about uh, getting you in on that. Our speaker today is Dr. Elizabeth Swing. Uh, she is teaching uh, Anthropology 502, Languages and Globalization, and uh, fairly new to KU, but we welcome her here. She is a linguistic anthropologist uh, with evidently a background in multiple fields. Uh, who currently investigates issues related to bilingualism, language endangerment, globalization, and emotions. And her, speech today, her, her lecture today is on troubling talk, the politics of the distinction of the upper story of the Vitae, welcome and welcome to my talk today. As you noticed, uh, the title changed. That sometimes happens when you're writing a paper and you say, <laughs> nope, I don't like that title anymore. So, talking about one's troubles may seem to be like an act of complaining about everyday problems or even lamenting about the tragedies that a person has survived or is facing. This type of talk is troubling because it reveals that happiness is not necessarily attainable and that optimism is not a blind condition, but rather one fraught with anger and acceptance of loss. In this paper, I offer an anthropological perspective on how troubling dialogues affect speakers of upper soar in Eastern Germany. This endangered, whoops, up. This endangered Western Slavonic language is often confused by outsiders with German because of language mixing. Although analysis of Sorbian linguistic practices could have focused solely on mishmash, what Sorbs identify as language mixing of standardized and non-standardized resources, I've recognized the contextual and metapragmatic significance of troubling talk. To do this, I will marry a discussion of current gossip in the Sorbian community with a historical narrative. By rethinking troubles, talk, and gossip, I offer arguments that transcend this European context and reframe discussions of language endangerment, bilingualism, affect, and more specifically, unhappiness. Moreover, gossip and troubling talk not only speaks to how a Sorbian person is unhappy, but also is the reasons why someone may not want to be noticed by other Sorbs. To take this one step further, I present a case for understanding the hidden processes of being indistinct by tacking back and forth between contemporary concerns and historical conjunctures. To illustrate the profound influence of a politics of indistinction on the everyday lives of sorts, I would like to talk about an ethnographic moment during my field work. I had met Laura, a 50-something-year-old teacher, at the Sorbian Tur Tourist Center, Center where she was painting Sorbian Easter eggs. 
afterwards, she invited me to the school where she worked to observe her classroom that was literally located in the basement. When I met her later at the middle school, she joked with me and said that she was alone in the basement. And I sensed her anger at the physical and professional demotion. During socialism, she was a teacher in a Sorbian-only school, but now taught Sorb as a foreign language to a group of rowdy students who appeared uninterested in learning Sorb. This middle-aged woman had refused, repeatedly refused to meet with me outside of the school and said that she only wanted to work in her garden. She told, almost like she recognized her losing battle, she still worked in a place where she had to speak sore every day. <clears throat> and she told me outside of school she did not want to see or speak to another sore. Her poignant, ironic utterance offers purchase on the re on the lived realities of ordinary suffering, or what Pierre Bourdieu would call la petite misere, the little death. Understanding Laura's desire to remove herself from the everyday politics requires some background information about Sorbian linguistic history. This bilingual, multi-dialectical community is bordered by Poland to the east, that would be Poland, and the Czech Republic to the south, Uh, the area of Wuchitsa, Lusatia, Lausitz, was settled in the 6th century as part of the Wendish movement into Eastern Europe and by the Germans from the West. Etymologically, the name of the Sorbian homeland, meaning small draft, evokes the image of a Slavic island in a German sea. The original Slavic tribes, tribes known as the Wuchitsi, the present-day Lower Sorbian community, and the Milcheni, the present-day Upper Sorbian dialect, occupied Upper Upper and lower soar. Kind of the reverse is what we think about in the US sometimes. Sometimes we think lower is southern, but no, not always. Um, uh, Lusatia. The Sorbian community developed two distinct dialects or language varieties depending upon who you ask. Some Sorbs believing that the two codes represent distinct languages. Um, uh, and in the northern Lusatia, the lower so Sorbian community experienced greater linguistic oppression than the upper Sorbian community did and the lower sorb is in greater danger of becoming obsolete. Another discourse of difference involves um, notions uh, is religious affiliation. While lower Sorbian speakers are Protestant, the upper Sorbian community is Catholic. Some other important dynamics include generational differences, and that could encompass another 45 minute talk, so let me be brief. Children are still <coughs> learning sorb, and all sorbs speak at least two languages, but their feelings about their mother tongue are not as simple as saying, I love Sorb, or I like Sorb better than German. Like Bruegel's portrayal of the fall of Icarus, Sorbs are often invisible on a global stage, yet that does not mean that they are invisible to other Sorbs. Rather, Sorbs may find themselves under greater scrutiny from other Sorbs. From a macro-sociological perspective, notions of indistinction are particularly apt in the current moment. Many Sorbs recognize that their current dilemmas and even collective dissatisfactions of not being heard by German or supranational policymakers, endangered language researchers, and their own academic community. To extend my visual analogy, these forms of benign neglect or ignoring resonate with their position on the global stage, like Icarus is invisible to the farmer. Yet as a lived form of Catch-22, Sorbian linguistic and political history also reinforces a need to lament about their position in relation to regional, national, and supranational interests. While the linkages to globalized discourses certainly deserve merit, my ethnographic attention here is on how these processes become treacherously complicated in endangered landscapes. By concentrating on how people navigate these trains, I hope to bring attention to how we ethnographers, researchers, and scholars consider the ways politics impacts bilingual practices. But only after a few weeks during my dissertation field work did I begin to wonder if I was a killjoy to my informants. Although I did not know it, I was marking myself as an outsider and acting like an American who had taken to heart the words life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Benjamin Franklin's words are so woven into my being that I could not imagine circumstances in which happiness was understood by sorbs as threatened. Only when I reconsidered emotional discontent did I begin to understand troubling talk and evaluations of mishmash, even as sorbs told me that I could not record naturally occurring conversations. 
Their refusals were an early indicator of what happens when Sorbs feel insecure about their language use. More significantly, their resistance to recording hinted at a politics of indistinction as a form of linguistic agoraphobia. Their concerns about my data complexion exemplify worries about what is a good example of Sorbianness. Their refusals are a form of silencing and, in turn, part of a politics of indistinction. This methodological issue is directly related to language ideologies and conflicting ideas about what is Sorb and what is the Sorbian language. Competing linguistic ideologies, of which there are in several, impact ideas about Sorbian mishmash. Many st Sorbs still value images of Sorbian folk traditions, like the dancers on the stage there. Others hold dear a hyperbolic valorization of older monolingual speakers, some of whom still wear the traditional dress. Yet some Sorbs wrestle with the demands of the current moment as they endeavor to be ideal multilingual cosmopolitans. I argue that dissonance and consonance among these ideologies contribute to a politics of indistinction and troubling talk for several reasons. They provide a basis for stereotypes and reinforce diglossic divisions. Thus, ideological contradictions also make it hard to determine what a good sort or a bad sort is. At the heart of these dialogues, is an awareness of loss and death, an everyday nearness to it. Yet this awareness is also a type of optimism that is not entirely sanguine because of a realization of what we love or desire will someday be gone. In this evocative evaluation of Sorbian and language endangerment, several sentiments arise. Fear of language death, exasperation at not being heard, anger at having to give alarm for such a long time, and perhaps even surprise and hope that the Sorbian language and culture will survive the current dangers fa facing it. Like Benjamin Wharf's experiences, experiences with the empty gasoline can and the different meanings associated with an utterance, I discovered various sentiments about endangerment within the comments made by bilingual Sorbs. Like the double entendre in the theater worker statement, Sorbs often encounter intertwined messages of survival and death in their daily linguistic lives. Through Sorbian narratives and understanding of everyday lived politics, I demonstrate that Sorbs self-silence, thereby often becoming invisible, like the image of Icarus that I offered to you. While historical and contemporary dynamics characterize a contact zone with Germans and other Sorbs, this same zone is also an emotional site of a multi-language world. Sorbs may take control of their own lives by expressing their dis-ease with the historical and contemporary situation often navigating a range of stances from not speaking Sorb to being a bilingual Sorb that engender both self critique and a critical gaze of Sorbian others. Okay, here comes the theory part. Distancing and emotional discontent resonate with Gregory Bateson's understanding of schismogenesis as drastic disturbances to the fabric of social relations. While Bateson recognizes the importance of emotional factors in a social milieu, uh, he does not relate emotions to other discourses and leaves the long of people to their fate as powerless. Rather than considering Sorbs as helpless, I argue that linguistic distancing has historically been and continues to, to provide a defense, albeit problematic, against continuing threats to their survival. Jan Blomert advances another framework to think about intrasocietal dynamics and calls for a sociolinguistics of mobility. He focuses on narratives of getting out of here through language choice, as in if you speak an endangered language, you might want to speak English because it means that you'll get a better job. That's his basic argument. He focuses on narratives of getting out of here through language choice. While his points are valid, I draw attention to local discourses that are embodied acts of self-silencing. Let me describe some of the ways that Sorbs get out of the Sorbian community. For many Sorbs, this may entail physical relocation to another part of Europe or away from Lusatia. However, for other Sorbs, getting out may emerge in a change in their activities and practices that correspond to not speaking the language, self-distancing, gossiping, or talking about the troubles. Building here on Alexei Yurtek's discussion of the politics of indistinction, he wants to, quote, broaden our understanding of what politics is what forms it takes, and what effects it may have produced. Through a consideration of the performance artists of the late Soviet years, your chapter raises that the artist's inspiration came from the images of death and the absurdity of life. 
The experience of these audits are similar to the daily encounters that SORVs have with ideas of cultural and linguistic death, as well as forms of German control and Sorbian surveillance. Another aspect of the artist's performance involves language use and learning how to speak incoherently with words and long pauses, as well as avoiding analysis of their actions. This manipulation of language and avoidance of analysis resonates with many of my obstacles during data collection. For example, I asked many sorts about the political meaning of the play Swalti Pouts, The Golden Thumb, a play about finding and saving a magical plant. To me, the researcher, the magical plant symbolize Sorbian language and culture. Yet many Sorbs refused to discuss the deeper meaning of the play, play, while some saw a connection to socialist collectivization. Their differences of opinion speak to a complicated emotional dynamic regarding survival. Through outright denials of linkages to language use, many Sorbs resisted considering the linguistic significance of the play. Perhaps their responses were not as extreme as those of the Soviet artists, but they were equally dramatic. Thus, I adapt your check's insights to reconsider resistance in the Sorbian community to include this form of silence as another narrative of displacement in which Sorbs distance themselves from discussions about language survival. A politics of indistinction also intersects with urban village loyalties. Others, um, some Sorbs may critique other Sorbian speakers in indicating that they consider themselves hypocritical or non-acceptable Sorbs. By engaging in troubles talk, Sorbs link language use to specific spaces, like in, inside the theater right here. For example, Sorbs associated with urban spaces may choose not to speak Sorb at home, withdraw from certain Sorbian scenes, or take frequent vacations, thereby getting out of Germany for a short time. So as you can tell in these, these weren't things that I just heard once or twice. These are things that I heard repeatedly. And that is why they're like a lament. And that is why they are noteworthy. That you, I would hear them every day, it would seem like, at points in time. And that I cannot convey in a talk to you. When you hear everyone saying to you, um, they don't work, they don't work, they don't work. It becomes a lament. So in contrast, villagers may refuse to visit certain linguistic sites like the theater, institutional spaces, or the tourist center. Instead, villagers may speak Sorb only at home and do not earn their income from language maintenance. <clears throat> Ironically, both rural and urban Sorbs blame the other Sorbs for not working for language survival. Both urbanites and villagers criticize other Sorbs for not speaking Sorb or devoting only one aspect of their life to Sorbian maintenance. So that means either they only devote home or they only devote work. Confusion about Sorbian identity and language also reinforces its dire existence. If I'm German, I speak German. But if I'm Sorb, then I speak Sorb. By choosing one or the other language, Sorbs are forced to choose one or form or another of linguistic silencing. Yet code switching is no panacea to overcome the difficulties in language choice. As I would come to find out that being bilingual is like walking, and if you try to walk on one foot, eventually you will fall over. And it was demonstrated to me, granted there was a beer involved, but. <laughs> <laughs> so Mishmash is characterized by multiple repertoires and not German or Sorbian ones, um, as Sorbs reinterpret alternation between languages as another form of subtle balancing of personal tastes. Yet for many Sorbs, the struggle to find satisfaction is often troubled by ideas about German-Sorbian differences. With my own growing awareness, I began to recognize how Sorbs experience alienation through deeply felt yet contested discourses about their worth as a polity and as individuals. Historical and contemporary anxieties about endangerment and economics are prime sites to consider the effective realities of language worlds. Sorbian discussions of funding increased my sensitivity to these issues related to political economy because of the 2007 cut to funding from 16 to 12 million euros. This decrease in, in, in ensuing redistribution of local monies brought economic concerns to the dinner table. Sorbian expressions of anger come from fears about their linguistic survival and the realization that losses in funding contribute to linguistic and cultural loss. Sorbian dry tribes also reflect an inverted Malthusian fear because their funding even fails to match their needs. 
as in sometimes there's not enough money to have someone learn how to do sorbing and stitchery for the costumes that they wear. And that can become an argument. No, they should spend the money on this. No, they should spend the money on that. In other words, money does not change everything. Other important concerns include declining population rates due to falling birth rates, assimilation, geographical assimilation, uh, shrinking of the Sorbian homeland, loss of villages, closing of schools, reduced production of Sorbian events, less production of books and newspapers, and immigration. While these issues are significant, I believe other factors also threaten the survival of the Sorbian community. For example, decreasing opportunities for face-to-face -face contact, and in my work, emotions. Specific Sorbian concerns range from not having a Sorbian school that one's children or grandchildren may attend to whatever governmental entity, Saxon, German, EU, or the imagined global community, will be deaf to Sorbian concerns. At its most basic level, Sorbs fear that if their resources, their language, their voice, and their assets are not used, or funded or available, then, the, then they and those resources will be lost. As Sorbs embrace beliefs that their language is a treasure or approximate their worth according to population size, number of schools, number of books, things like that, those are material objects, they connect endangerment to economics. But this commodification of a fetishized language is not the whole picture. Thus I take Jane Hill's questions of who is listening and what do they hear one step further to say what are Sorbs saying and how do they feel about what they hear. Consider when Sorbs say or hear any of these <coughs> critiques. I heard such comments in reference to language <coughs> in plays or text and in public spaces. These utterances reveal personal taste about language use or as Sorbs described it, sounding funny. So saying something is a shitty language could happen to be said about both Sorb and German. Doesn't matter. Both of them. Shitty. In point of fact, one of the ones that came up most often was Dustling Kamish. Saying something sounds funny is part of troubling talk because it hints that not sounding funny <coughs> is near to impossible. For example, if a Sorbian sort of, sort of utterance is too pure, too sore, or too impure, too mixed, <coughs> then it sounds funny. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. These choices are indicative of a linguistic politics of indistinction exemplify why the Sorbian community is a house divided. In order to get a bad taste out of the mouth, to borrow from Michel Bakhtin, a Sorb often moves to a different place in the linguistic terrain while positioning other Sorbs in that undesirable term that they often literally avoid. So this is Serbsky Dome. This is the national monument. And a lot of times people would say that that's where all the fat cats work. And they didn't want to go hang out there. And if I had to go over to the tourist center, which was over in this corner here, they would say, oh, you poor, you know, and you could just feel it. They didn't want to go there. So in examining the following utterances here that center on the differences between Sorbs who work in the urban institutions and those who consider themselves villager, multiple tensions arise. Moreover, some Sorbs are expressing their disapproval, desires to distance, and a yearning to be free from linguistic and social pressures. For example, in 2 and 6. So if they talked about, like, well, they're not doing the show there. Das ist nicht mein Problem. Das ist nicht mein Problem. Das ist dein Problem. Nicht mein. So um, statements like one, three, and four are examples of Sorbs gave me that they could not meet with me. Indirectly, statements like three, five, and eight link emotional problems to political economy. To explain further, references to a vacation suggest that some Sorbs have the financial means to go on a trip or could escape local politics. You have to understand, too, that in this area of the world, they are at 25% unemployment in Bautzen. I noted that many of the Sorbian elite spoke of their vacations with a note of pride, almost bragging, while narrating their need to get away because ich habe zu viel Stress, I'm under too much pressure, I'm too stressed out. Yet others denigrated Sorbs who took too many vacations in their opinion. 
These declarations that hint at displeasure also employ didactic references using I or they, reinforcing urban-rural differences. Thus far, I've drawn attention to local contemporary dialogues. Like other anthropologists interested in language shift, code switching, historical transformations, transnationalism, and, and linguistic variation, I argue that intra-societal factors are of critical importance in understanding language loss. Yet I've become increasingly aware of how the Sorbs were turning their anger on other Sorbs. Their refusals and other indicators of divisions in the Sorbian community led me to implementing another methodological tool, ethnography cum translation. In a detailed linguistic analysis of Sorbian translations of Monroe Leafs, The Story of Ferdinand, if you don't know, it's the story of a little bull who'd rather smell the flowers than fight in the arena. I tend to linguistic variation and vir virtuosity. My analysis exposes how Sorbs linguistically adapt to a politics of indistinction and notions of mishmash. Like Nancy Dorian, I'm grateful that many Sorbs griped and complained about the troubles in Lusatia, narrated their personal dilemmas while letting me see their pain, and even refused to let me record. Without these fieldwork catalysts, I would never have dis discovered Ferdinand would provide a wealth of data. So to reiterate, many Sorbs profoundly experience life linguistically, emotionally, socially, and politically as walking the line. I hope that my work answers, offers a response to Wolf's call for an anthropology of happiness that considers the intersections between cultural dynamics and linguistic practices. In my dissertation, I argue that the mechanics of linguistic and cultural survival entail complex negotiations of selfhood, while challenging a simplistic understanding of code switching and interlingual diglossic differences. Resonating with Laura and the Sorbian workers' description, I detailed or ordinary suffering as Sorbs manage conflicting emotional stances and counter structural inequalities and experience the contradictions of multi-language worlds. So my, my discussion of a politics of distinction also focuses on how Sorbs see themselves through their distancing from other Sorbs through these critiques. So once again, Bhakti, I love Bhakti, this notion of heteroglossy, I acknowledge that linguistic consciousness is multiple dialogic and emotional. In the Sorbian community, this consciousness resonates with the metalinguistic laments of that sounds funny or that is invented. The current dialects also resonate with a shared history filled with the troubles that Sorbs talk about at length. As shown in this image, the discursive tensions between ideas of a traditional folk as opposed to a modern citizenry may entail queries about who are the Sorbs. Are Sorbian folk traditions invented? So is the dance like they did it 50 years ago? Then do the traditional dances strike some sorts as funny because it's not out of the club? They do have a lot of clubs, too. Um, thus, are the sorbs watching the dancers realistic, these sorbs here? Or are the people watching the dancers the ideal? These questions reveal the dis difficulties that sorbs may have answering them. Moreover, these issues are about living with a sense of cruel optimism that is based on anger about historical linguistic tragedies and contemporary issues. So Sorbian linguistic history entails moments when Sorbs acquired an increasing set of attachments to language use, while political processes cast aspersions on Sorbian linguistic worth. In a comparative analysis of Sorbian texts, I identified five critical moments from Sorbian historical narratives. <coughs> These meta-narratives not only engender a sense of cruel optimism, but also historically in index transformations in language, ethnicity, national consciousness, and political status. Four of these moments correlate with significant transformations in the Sorbian language. First, the status of the Sorbs changed when the Sorbian tribes became subordinated to the German tribes in the 10th century. Between the 10th and 19th centuries, the Sorbian community was under the control of a Bohemian king, a Polish prince, I think again a Bohemian king, the Brandenburg royalty, those were Germans, and some other people. So they just got passed all around. These shifts in territorial control foreshadow contemporary discourses of non-national status and laid the historical foundation for ambiguity with regard to Sorbian political subjectivities. Second, the Sorbs became two separate national communities, Upper Sorb and Lower Sorb, in the 19th century. This process also coincided with the standardization of two literary languages associated with the Catholic and Protestant churches. Third, when the Nazi regime adopted an aggressive and racist policy towards the Sorbs, the Sorbs experienced an extreme threat to their existence as an ethnic group and a linguistic community. Four, during the socialist period, this would be what the buildings looked like during socialism. 
hasn't been renovated yet. Um, this source received meaningful state support that was designed primarily to ensure the development of social assistance citizens and only secondarily a policy intended to safeguard the survival for them as an ethno-linguistic national minority. Fifth, this would be an EU building. Um, and sometimes this, uh, the difference can be quite striking. In the newly imagined and integration of the EU, the Sorbs experienced a new threat as a lesser lang used language community, a people without a state, but whose institutions face severe financial cutbacks and a minority with real fears about their survival. So while the socialist narratives resonate with the David and Goliath theme, Koslin uh, suggests that there is a new pessimistic tone. This pessimism <clears throat> entails a critical awareness that unhappiness is part of the current and future realities in which Sorbs are Stunde Europäer, or dead Europeans. Indeed, one particularly disturbing type of printed gossip levels a pointed finger at socialist policy. While socialist texts see German oppression and imperialism as the cause of the Sorbian troubles, Edward Peck asks a post-socialist question. How positive was the GDR minority politics really by blaming these policies for the loss of 50,000 Sorbs, so the population decreased? Turning to the differences between the socialist and post-socialist histories also illuminates the sense of cruel optimism. Having lost the possibility to become a separate nation state in the 10th century, Sorbian national consciousness began to develop. The Sorbs attempted three times to become a separate nation. During the mid-19th century, participating in the democratic re revolutions that were a part of the larger European political shift to a nationalized system of states, through a petition to President Woodrow Wilson at the Treaty of Versailles in 1917, and in an appeal to Stalin during the Moscow Foreign Ministers Conference in 1947. According to their own national ideas based on Schmoller, that would be a Sorb, its national definition, a Sorbian nation does not need a Sorbian nation state. Many Sorbs still accept this version of national identity. To some degree, this form of nationalism also helps in accepting the loss of autonomy and self-determination while, while foreshadowing the post-national realities of a globalized world. In the socialist text, Sorbs are a national minority and bilingual socialist citizens. Um, in contrast, post-socialist texts exemplify a meta-narrative of EU global or multinational citizenry whose value rests in their traditional count culture. Now the bilingual Sorbs are a regional community that has lost its nationalist aspirations for autonomy in modern transformations. These socialist and post-socialist commentaries also handed a state of rest, a Sorb community in a perpetual state of alarm. Sorbs, as speakers of an endangered language, have seen their value of their language repeatedly change as they have been talked about their own demise. As I focus on the historical conjunctures that have led to the contemporary Sorbian affective discourses, I consider a grand narrative of Sorbian history from failed attempts to become an autonomous nation to possible extermination during the Third Reich. In the hyperbolic description of Sorbian survival for a thousand years, a state of incredulity, as Jean Francis Lyotard would describe it, characterizes language death. From the nationalizing meta-narratives from socialist and post-socialist texts, I've also highlighted the historical basis and contemporary materializations of Sorbian fears that come from broken promises. Yet behind the optimism of that earlier statement, still not dead, uh, come another awareness emerges, one that is not blind or emotionally unaffected by historical cruelty that the Sorbs have survived. In thinking about survival despite overwhelming law odds, Laura Berlant considers Cruel optimism, a condition of ordinary life in which people, quote, learn to manage, identify, and maintain the hazy luminosity of their attachment to being X, in this case being Sorb, given that their attachments were promises and not possessions after all. Sorbs have heard promises from a series of governmental in entities that would protect their national, linguistic, and cultural value. Yet so Sorbian attachments are promises to be managed, or more specifically, how Sorbs consider themselves a folk. This very term invokes a promise that if the Sorbs protect, protect their tradition, then they will be protected. So concurrent with notions of folk, Sorbian management of language use includes marked displays, for example, on an answering machine message in a note left at a friend's house, or terms of address like I used always calling my father-in-law, Nano. 
At the same time, bilingual Sorbs are not just members of a traditional Slavic minor minority who hear a ritual performed in an endangered language or have attended a school funded by the Saxon government. Rather, they are people with national rights who fashion themselves according to multiple ideas of what Sorbs are and how they should use their linguistic resources. They are not just, what the implication is, they are not just Sorbian Easter eggs that can be bought in a tourist store. <coughs> Yet at the same time, um, diglossic differences frame everyday interactions and provide a local rallying point for troubling talk. Yet all this talk about the past is not always desirable. In talking about her co-workers and peers who worked in the Sorbian institutions, Charlotte invokes the sociality of happiness and positions herself against others for the use of they. This and Charlotte was not the only person who said they think too much about the past. In other ways, for, for her, happiness involves a platonic sharing of pleasure and or distress. Ironically, she differentiates herself from other Sorbs who worked in the Sorbian institutional complex. She actually worked in the theater, and was a very famous actress, so many pictures of her. Her accusation, one of historical obsession, suggests another perspective, one in which Sorbs must focus on contemporary problems. Yet she contradicts herself in her reflexive commentary on herself as a socialist child. She says, I was a child of socialism. Saying that socialism was a time when she felt happier because there was more funding to support a richer and more vital Sorbian life. Her nostalgic identification with socialism speaks to another historical conundrum. Are things better now for the Sorbs than they were under socialism? Historical narratives, both from the personal and communal standpoint, bond the upper Sorbian community I need water. <laughs> Bond the upper Sorbian community together in myriad ways. Ironically, Charlotte also contemplates the past as she ap apprehends her own contemporary state of well-being because she implies that she is not happier now while thinking about what she has lost. Some work that she used to love doing when the theater used to put out 10 plays a year in Sorb and not two. Furthermore, temporal shifts coincide with other macro-sociological transformations that affect personal day daily lives. Personal gains and losses are often associated with the materiality of language worlds. The loss of Sorbian villages and schools with loved ones. The broken promises of the American government, Hitler, the Red Army, Stalin, and the EU with a sense of political alienation. Finally, economic discourse is often linked, tr linked to troubling talk, while issues related to language death are connected to personal troubles. All of these defeats symbolize broken promises for supporting the, the Sorbian language and culture that has also become personalized. <clears throat> I would like to share a final anthropological reflection on a language protest. During the summer of 2005, Christina invited me to march in a demonstration. One of her mother's co-workers was dismissed on the grounds of speaking Sorb at work. The protesters, mainly Sorbian youth, gathered together to voice their concerns without speaking. In a surprising decision, the silent protest spoke volumes about Sorbian feelings about language use. During the march, they wore flasters or bandages over their mouths. And this protest contrasts strongly with the everyday battles that Sorbs face in which their rights are protected by Saxon law. While, Saxons have often have, uh, while Sorbs often have sufficient grounds to speak out against linguistic discrimination, they rarely do. With a long history of Sorbs experiencing linguistic prejudice, the Sorbian language was ban first banned in 1293 AD, forbidden again in 1327 AD, and outlawed in 1937 during the Third Reich. Sorbs feel historical and contemporary passions for their linguistic rights as a national minority. A nation on a state, a nation without a state, and a group of people who should be able to speak work, speak SORB at work, in business, in schools, at public events, and in private interactions. Another facet of uh, effective discourses involves the voices and visible presence of bilingual SORBs. Not only were SORB silenced politically, as I mentioned earlier, but notions of silence are a significant part of East-West German discourses of difference. Um, as part of Sprachlosigkeit, speechlessness, and affirmations by East Germans with the protest chant of Wir sind ein Volk, we are a people, one people. East Germans experienced a particular dynamic of silencing. In addition, state patrol became visible and real to East Germans with the imprisonment of political dissidents in Gefängnis 2, Stasi Knast, 
and Gefängnis 1, the largest socialist prison, also known as Das Gelbes Elend, which means the yellow misery, in Bautzen, the urban center for the suburbs. So ironically, these prisons are in Bautzen. These factors all contribute to the linguistic chauvinism directed to the Sorbs as East Germans after reunification. Thus, Didi are discourses of silencing add another element to the transformation of public battles into private gossip. All of these dynamics, and here you can see the flask or the bandage on his mouth during the protest, reinforce a process by which a history of indistinction becomes local gossip. How a national minority turns its anger and sentiments of cool optimism on itself. While I have not discussed the linguistic specifics of mishmash, I propose that an anthropological approach to local gossip warrants theoretical attention for several reasons. First, by bringing together historical perspective, emotions, and current dynamics, I expose how prejudice, broken promises, and structural inequality have real impact on everyday life. As a corollary, questions about identity and defining who you are are central to understanding the many implications of speaking a minority language. While the answers to these questions cannot be fixed by the sweep of a policy of a pen and language policy, I call for an awareness of how being unsure about your political, linguistic, and national survival may contribute to not, not fighting for your position. In other words, how a public fight becomes a private battle waged every day at the dinner table and the pause between acts of a play or in a classroom or in the basement. Second, I refocus attention on the politics within a community while being aware of how oppression is not just about the dominant group. From this, I hope to offer another perspective on power grounded in Bordeauxian thought. Third and finally, I highlight the importance of linguistic practices from a cultural standpoint. My hope is that this talk today has offered you another perspective on the lived realities of the smallest Slavonic nation and what it is to be a speaker of an endangered language. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to answering your questions and hearing your insights. And that would be Ferdinand. You never heard so much history.